Good afternoon and welcome to NASA's Johnson Space Center here in Houston, Texas. We are live with a press conference with the crew of NASA's SpaceX Crew 7 crew who has just got back from the International Space Station. They had an impressive mission of 199 days in space, 197 of those spent at the International Space Station. This crew saw the arrival of seven visiting vehicles and the departure of seven more. Jasmine Mogbelli participated in a spacewalk, and they, as a crew, contributed to hundreds of hours of scientific experiments during their mission aboard the International Space Station. Here with me today is Jasmine Mogbelli, Andreas Mogensen, and Satoshi Furukawa. Of course, an important member of the team, Konstantin Borisov. He was the fourth crew member on the Crew 7 mission. He has gone home already to reunite with his family, uh, so we won't be hearing from him today, but we're excited to hear from this crew. So for media here in the room, if you've got a question, go ahead and, and raise your hand, and we'll, we'll get over to you. We'll also be que taking questions on our phone bridge. So if you're dialing in on the phone, go ahead and press star one, and that will enter you into our question queue, and we'll uh, get your voice so that we can, you can talk to the crew. And then finally, we'll be taking questions on social media using hashtag AskNASA. So if you're watching on social media and have a question for the crew, go ahead and send it using that hashtag. Uh, but first, we're gonna kick it off with some opening remarks from Andreas Mogensen. Well, thank you, and uh, good afternoon to everyone. Personally, I'm feeling a little bit of a deja vu. I remember sitting here in, I think it was early August for our pre-launch press conference. Uh, and now we're back after uh, an incredible six months on board the space station. It's uh, impressive to think what has happened between these two press conferences. Um, it was a, a wonderful, wonderful experience, um, especially being part of this very international crew with uh, representatives for, from uh, four different countries and four different space agencies. Um, and of course, uh, our other three crew members uh, who launched on, on Soyuz. Um, it was really a, a, a terrific mission with a, a lot of scientific and technology development occurring uh, on board the International Space Station and just such a privilege for all of us to be part of this uh, mission. And it's uh, strange to be back on Earth um, after such a, an eventful six months in space. Yeah. Thank you so much, Andreas. We're gonna go to question in the room here first. Gina, you wanna kick us off? Gina Sinceri, ABC News. I think this is for each of you, but you know, your mission really isn't finished because you are still medical uh, guinea pigs, so to speak. What has the recovery been like coming back from that many months on orbit and zero gravity? How have you, how have you adjusted to that? Oh, uh, sure, I can start off. Uh, I was very curious, this being my first mission, how it would feel coming back. You, you don't, uh, most people don't get that experience to be away from uh, the 1G environment and then come back. Um, I felt very lucky when I got back. Um, I, I didn't feel nauseous or motion sickness at all, so it was more a, a curiosity thing about, oh, this feels very weird, I felt very wobbly. My, Girls still ask me, um, mommy, are you still wobbly? Because the first two days, I was like, oh, mommy's wobbly. Don't pull on me. And, uh, and then everything just felt very heavy. I remember picking up my sneaker for the first time felt like a dumbbell. And you know, if you jump on a trampoline for a really long time, your legs feel like lead afterwards. It was like that to the extreme. My, my neck was very tired from holding up my head. But very quickly, your, I, I felt at least my body like readapted back to gravity. And, now I can walk and drive and do a lot of normal things again. 
Yeah, it's, it's been a process, certainly. Um, you know, from, from the first few days where, like, as, as Jasmine said, you're, you're kind of very wobbly. You, know, you haven't really found your earth legs yet. Um, and then from there, it just kind of progresses to a, a little bit of stiffness and soreness in the legs and the bat, back because suddenly you're walking and standing up again. Um, and then just kind of just getting the coordination back. I remember about after a week, I, I tried to play a little bit of basketball. And in my mind, uh, I knew exactly what I wanted to do when I tried to do a layup, but my legs just didn't really do what I was picturing them <laughs> doing. And it's just, so it just takes a little bit of time, but it's, it's you know, we're, I would say almost back to normal now after almost two weeks. Yep. <clears throat> Same here. Uh, for the first couple of days, uh, I was not able to look down because, uh, because I got sick easily. And I was not able to put on my shoes by myself. But that, uh, uh, after that recovery, I felt that the same time, uh, uh, a day or two, I, I felt that the bowling ball size heavy <laughs> I felt I felt the existence of my head, <laughs> and that, uh, yeah, and my back hurt hurt, and day by day I recovered and uh, got more stable, and recovering. Thank you, Gina, for your question. We're going to go over to our phone bridge now. Um, if you've got a question on the phone, please state your name and affiliation and who your question is directed to. We'll start off with Robert Perlman with Space.com. So I, we're going to figure out our phone bridge for a moment as we get Robert Perlman on the line. Um, in the meantime, we'll go to a question here in the room. Uh, thank you for uh, coming out and giving this press conference. I had a question for really to apply for each of you, like kind of like Gina's question. What did each of you find the most interesting, scientifically speaking, of all the, uh, the experiments that you had to conduct? I'm sure they're all interesting, but which one of those experiments personally was interesting to you, maybe more than some of the rest? Go ahead. I mean, it's um, it's hard to say because, as you say, there are so many interesting experiments. Uh, but uh, you know, one experiment that I was looking forward to a lot was the the ESAS 3D metal printer, um, which arrived a little bit later than anticipated uh, because uh, Cygnus 20 was uh, delayed a, a few months, and so I was only able to install it uh, rather than actually start the experiment. But I'm really looking forward to Crew 8 uh, performing that experiment because that. Uh, is a, um, a technology that could have a big impact on the future of, of human spaceflight. You know, being able to print uh, tools, uh, nuts and bolts, or, or even more complicated pieces of, of equipment uh, on demand. You know, the space station is complex. It requires constant maintenance and repair, and, and we're still very, very uh, dependent on resupply from the Earth. But, uh, you know, if we could print things, especially in metal, in the future, that would be... Uh, be incredible. I think something I'd say uh, similar but a little different, one of the experiments or technology demonstrations I thought was really interesting was the biofabrication facility, uh, 3D printing, but this time using cells as the ink and printing tissues. And so while we were up there, um, they were experimenting with printing basically m miniature hearts. And uh, that's just something that to me, I couldn't even wrap my head around we're talking about printing human tissues. And uh, similar to what uh, Andy was saying, think about the impacts that could have for, um, you know, both here on Earth and also the future space travel. And as we go farther and aren't uh, able to just use our resources on Earth, uh, that'll be a game changer. Hey, uh, let me introduce uh, JAXA experiment, uh, cell, cell gravity sensing. Uh, which advances science, uh, but also uh, benefit uh, us on Earth, uh, because it uh, investigates how uh, mammal cells uh, cells uh, uh, detect uh, gravity, and uh, it is a very uh, upstream of the reaction, and followed by uh, cell. Uh, 
signal transduction and multiple chemical, uh, biochemical reactions and resulting in uh, mu muscle atrophy or bone loss. So uh, by understanding the very upstream uh, phenomenon uh, could lead to prevention of muscle atrophy or uh, bone loss uh, encountered in space. And not only in space, but also it could uh, be applied to uh, similar pathology on the ground, m muscle atrophy or uh, bone loss. That would be a great uh, benefit for us. We'll take another question here in the room. We have a question over here. Good afternoon, Lars Ulysses, NASA crew surgeon. And the gentleman before me uh, took my number one question, so I'll lead off with number two and uh, capitalizing on uh, Andreas's uh, point of eventful. Uh, this question would be for each of you. Uh, what personally was the biggest challenge for you during Expedition 70? And uh, what do you see as the next big milestone in space travel? I mean, for, for, for me personally, the biggest challenge was being away from, from my children, I think. Uh, I have three children, ages of uh, five, seven, and 10, and uh, being away from them for, for half a year was, was probably the biggest challenge. Yeah. Um, and in terms of, of uh, you know, the future, personally, what I'm really looking forward to is our return to the moon. You know, we've spent the last, uh, 25 years on board the International Space Station, performing science and technology development uh, to become more knowledgeable uh, and smarter about what it means and what it takes to live and work in space. And I think you know we are ready to capitalize on that work and uh, to, to move back to the moon and, and from there, hopefully, further into space. Thank you. I think we're gonna try out our phone bridge one more time. Uh, Robert Perlman. Are you here, Juan, with us? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Um, this is Robert Perlman with Space.com. Um, for all three of you, um, between your science experiments, spacewalks, and visiting vehicles, it seems watching here from, the, from Earth that you had to be constantly busy. But were there any boring days in space? Or did you ever wake up and just feel completely unmotivated to get anything done? And then how did you get past that? Can you call on a sick, a sick day and take the day off? So, so I, caught, I, I caught most of the question. I, I think it was basically were there ever, ever any days that uh, you were kind of unmotivated or any bad days in space? Um, I think if I'm giving the honest answer, like anything else, you know, if you're spending six, six and a half months somewhere like we did, um, you are going to have bad days, absolutely. I loved being on the space station. I wouldn't trade it for the world. It was the most incredible thing I've done in my life. But there were definitely days where, you know, like Andy, I, I missed my kids. They were changing a lot while I was gone. And, um, you know, there's a, a certain point where you realize, oh, I'm, I'm missing a lot of milestones and, and things back here on Earth. Um, in, terms of, uh, in terms of the work, it was, uh, it was very fulfilling. Um, but there's also, in when you're living and working in space, um, our main mission was science and technology development, but you also have to maintain the space station. The, um, stowage on space station is quite difficult. I mean, we've been sending things up to space, space station for like 25 years now. And so there are also a lot of tasks that aren't uh, maybe as fulfilling as others where you're doing a groundbreaking experiment uh, or a technology demonstration. And so, uh, so sometimes I think when you're doing those tasks, it doesn't feel quite as fulfilling. But um, but at the end of the day, I, as I said, I absolutely loved it. I was very sad to leave Space Station. Um, but to be honest, yeah, there are definitely days that are harder than others. All right, we'll keep going on our phone bridge with uh, Robert Brodsky of Newsday. Robert, go ahead with your question. Hi, uh, this is uh, this is uh, Robert Brodsky from Newsday for uh, Jasmine, uh, the Long Islander. Um, I'm, I'm interested in your thoughts. Uh, the there was an incident, obviously, in November that got a lot of attention back home about the 
crew lock bag that got lost in space and sort of disappeared during a uh, flight walk. I was hoping you could just uh, share your thoughts about how that happened and, and your thoughts as it was going on um, about this incident that sort of gathered a lot of attention back in uh, back here. Yeah, absolutely. So um, first spacewalk, Laurel and I go out the door and, you know, you've trained years for this. It's a highlight, highlight of your career and, uh, and go out there and, you know, most importantly, we, we made it back in successfully and we accomplished the task, but losing that bag. And I'll, I'll tell you what happened from my, from my perspective is uh, I went, I stowed that bag and, and they have uh, built in hooks on them. And I put it on a handrail that I had told the ground team beforehand I was going to stow it on. And I remember it was even getting in my way and I pushed it out of my way a few times. And then, you know, I was busy doing my task on the camera at that point. Uh, an external camera on space station. And when I turned around, uh, the bag was not there. And that was honestly a very, like my heart sank in that moment because I knew exactly where I'd put that bag down and, and it was no longer there, which is a, obviously a big deal. And uh, so what, what I assume happened is the, the gate on that tether must not have closed all the way around the handrail. And so even though it seemed like it was tethered and acted like it was tethered, um, it, it must not have been in it, and it came off that handrail, and uh, I knew right away it was gone. And um, that that was that was a very hard moment for me, um, but I was proud of us. We worked through the re rest of that spacewalk. Thankfully, we didn't need that bag for the rest of the spacewalk, and we were able to replace everything in there. Uh, most things we had extra on space station, and some things we were able to send up. Uh, but it was def a definitely a hard moment for me. Uh, and it, it was funny when I remember my mom saying, oh, people have called, our relatives from all over the world have called and know about this tool back. And I'm like, you can do everything right for years and you make one mistake and everyone seems to know about it and that's just the way it goes. That's definitely the case <laughs> sometimes. Um, that space walk, by the way, is six hours and 42 minutes of first in Jasmine's career. Uh, we're going to go back to our phone bridge and take a question from Yusuke with Yomi Yuri. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Uh, I, Yusuke Tomiyama, the Yomi Yuri Shimbun, Japanese Daily. I have two questions to Furukawa-san. So what kind of experience during the Crew 7 mission will help you to teach two new astronaut candidates, Suwa-san and Yoneda-san? Uh, do you want to land on the moon someday in the future under the Artemis program? Thank you. Okay, th thank you for the uh, quest question. Well, uh, not a specific experiment, but the uh, I'd like to uh, give them, uh, brief them my uh, precious ex uh, experience uh, on on board the space station, uh, and uh, kind of give them kind of tips to live and work on board, and that would help their uh, own missions. And uh, in the future, yeah, under the uh, international cooperation, the uh, human expression to the moon and beyond uh, would uh, advance. I, I hope that that would go very well. Thank you for your question. Here on our phone bridge, we'll go now to Marvin Marshall with Space Report News. Hi, good afternoon, Crew 7. My name is Marvin Marshall from the Space Report News. Uh, thank you so much for having me today. It's an honor to have this opportunity. Uh, my question is for all three of you. Uh, during your mission aboard the ISS, uh, what were some of your favorite cities to look down upon, or you know, perhaps uh, what unexpected sites uh, left an impression on you? Uh, thanks again, and welcome back to Planet Earth. I mean, I found one of the big challenges is trying to take a photo of, of, a, of a spot that you want to photograph because you, you know, you, you try to time it out, um, you try to plan your day, uh, and then you, you make your way to the, the cupola uh, or one of the other windows, uh, and you get set, and you get ready, and then it's just a little bit well, even if it's not cloudy, maybe it's a little bit misty or the air isn't quite as clear and then you don't get a good uh, photo. Uh, so it's actually quite challenging 
if you're trying to capture specific uh, targets. So one of my favorite things was was the the surprising or unexpected uh, things that I saw when I was you know just by accident or not by accident, but just coincidentally flying through Coop or by Cupola, and I would say, well, let me just take 30 seconds or a minute to look out, and then seeing some of those unexpected things. And I actually I was quite lucky. I saw a lot of uh, really spectacular things, including a, uh, a large caldera uh, in Turkey, um, you know, uh, some, some, a mountain chain or a volcano chain in the Aleutian Islands. Uh, these were all just spur of the moment, uh, pure luck, where the, uh, the weather conditions were perfect. You know, it was absolutely clear, uh, and the air was also clear, so uh, I was able to take, you know, very, very sharp images. So, so that was really my, my favorite thing, was just these unexpected moments where uh, you happen to fly over something at the same time when, when the weather was perfect. So we'll go now to our social media questions. And if you have a question on social media, be sure to push hashtag ask NASA along with your question and we'll, we'll get them to the crew. We'll start off with Patricia Harris on Facebook who wants to know what did you miss the most while you were in space? Mine is, it, it's three things. It was very easy for me. Um, my, my family, my kids, my husband, um, you know, friends and family back home. Uh, real showers with running water. I um, love taking showers and you, you don't have running water like that on Space Station and I definitely found I missed that. Um, and then just food, right? We, we have a great variety and selection of food up there, but at the end of the day, um, you do have a, a set menu up there and you can't just eat whatever you want whenever you want and you, you start to realize oh food is really a source of a lot of pleasure just being able to I'm a big snacker so um, those were probably the, th the things I um, I missed the most yeah I mean the food situation is uh, you know for the first two months I was very very happy with the food it was Great, but then by the third month, you know, I'd, I'd eaten everything at least three times, and I thought, well, I don't. <laughs> now I'm a little bit bored. <laughs> well, for me, I, I missed a uh, hot bath, especially onsen hot spring, because water does not drop and accumulate under zero gravity. So since we've been talking about food. We do have a question from Daria Elena on Instagram who asks, what was your first meal after arriving back on Earth? Should I start? OK, well, so I'll give my first lunch and my first dinner. My first lunch was a nice roast beef sub with some Cape Cod potato chips. And then my first dinner was a 16-ounce prime rib with fries. I can't believe you had time to eat. I, they were delicious. Yeah. <laughs> I, I honestly, I went to bed early, and I, I skipped like I snacked a little bit, but then I skipped lunch and dinner and just went straight to bed. Yeah, yeah same here. I skipped lunch and dinner for, on the first day, but uh, I had some uh, fresh uh, fruits, uh, grape. That was great. Don't worry, I ate enough for both of you. <laughs> <laughs> the grape was great. I'm glad to hear it. We have a question now from Michael who wants to ask about re-entry. How did it feel and did your training prepare you for that feeling? Um, you want to start? Sure. <laughs> um, I, you can never truly prepare for, for something like that. I mean, there's just no way, even in a centrifuge on Earth, there's just no way to properly prepare for such a dynamic, such a unique event as re-entry. Um, but it, it was, I would say what I noticed in particular was the the smoothness of the landing uh, compared to my first flight with Soyuz. Uh, you know, the Dragon lands uh, in water and I think that, that makes a, a big difference. Uh, it was actually kind of a, a, a very soft Splash! It's almost like standing on the side of a pool uh, with a, you know, like an inflatable vest, and then just like plopping into the water, and then you come straight back to the surface, and then you're bobbing around a little bit. So very, uh, a very benign, I would say, landing in Dragon. So I, I didn't have the uh, experience of Soyuz beforehand like these two did, um, and so I was really curious. Again, similar, to, you know, I was curious how it would be like when we landed. I was curious how reentry would feel. And I remember a few things very uh, prominently. 
I remember looking up, because uh, I, I would usually call to the crew our Gs and our altitude as we came through the descent, and I remember seeing 0.2 Gs and thinking it felt like two Gs, and thinking, okay, am I still gonna be able to talk at four and a half Gs? Um, which thankfully I was, but uh, G, I mean, one G to me, when we hit one, that felt so heavy. Um, so that was one thing I definitely noticed. The, when the drogue chutes deployed, you know, Satoshi and Andy will say it wasn't uh, as dynamic as uh, on their Soyuz, but to me it felt very dynamic when the drogue chutes deployed, I think because your best of your system is off. So I felt, uh, you know, kind of like we were tumbling around. And I did think the, the landing was softer than I was expecting. You definitely knew we had splashed down, but it, uh, it wasn't hard at all. Um, and then, uh, I felt like we were really rocking side to side, and, and then everyone I talked to was like, oh, the water was glass when you landed. <laughs> there were barely any wind, so uh, definitely felt like a lot more motion than there was. Yeah, because we, we, I remember sitting in the capsule <laughs> after landing talking about how many degrees, and we were sure we were you know, bobbing back and forth 45, 60 degrees or something, but we were yeah, right front It turns out we were just doing that. <laughs> Yeah, uh, yeah, I'd like to echo my crewmates and uh, the regarding the parachute operations and land, uh, landing or splashdown, uh, Soyuz is uh, more uh, dynamic, but, very, but still very, very uh, safe with uh, many backup systems prepared. So we'll go to a question uh, from Luke on Instagram who wants to know, uh, big picture, so how has your perspective of going to space changed your view of life on Earth? Anyone can take this one. Um, I, I would say for me, I don't think it necessarily changed my perspective. I think it just reinforced a lot of things I already um, believed. I think for a very long time now, I've had a healthy sense of awareness that our planet, Earth, is extremely special. Um, and extremely beautiful, and it, it is where all life as we know it exists. And when you see it from the space station, it's just, it's undescribably beautiful. And similar to what Andy was saying earlier, just when I was working out on ARED or just had a moment during the day, I loved floating over to Cupola and looking out because it, almost every single time I was amazed. Uh, at what I saw, and it was always slightly different. Um, and then you just also, this sense of connectedness. I think I've always sensed that, you know, humans have more in common uh, than we have differences. And when you're up there with an international crew working together day after day, um, and looking back on Earth where, uh, where everyone is, and, and you, you traverse the Earth very rapidly, and so, you, you, you go from seeing one nation to another just in seconds, and I think you realize, okay, we're, we're really all so connected and all so close to one another. Um, so I don't think it changed my perspective, it just reinforced those things. Yeah, you, you certainly realize that the Earth is a planet, one single planet, and not you know, 195 or 200 different countries. Um, you know, most of the times you can recognize continents rather than, than individual countries. And so you realize it's, you know, it's our shared home. Um, you know, we're all humans trying to make a, a, a daily life for ourselves uh, on the same planet. Yes, S similar. Uh, when I was asked, where is your home? Uh, before flight, I thought it, uh, it was uh, Japan or Houston, Texas. But uh, on board the space station, after a couple of months, I thought uh, my home is planet Earth. And uh, I felt a similar way in my previous mission, and it, it, this is very similar, and I still think my home is the Earth. Thank you to all three of you. Those are some really special answers. We have a lot of questions here about uh, your readaptation back to Earth gravity. I know we've talked on it a little bit more, but maybe we can talk about kind of the process of what you guys are going through. The question I have is, so once they feel Earth's gravity again and land back on Earth, do these astronauts actually have to learn to walk again, or do you walk pretty much, you're able to walk as soon as you land on Earth? And then another question about asking how that readjustment to gravity has been. 
Well, I think one interesting thing um, that we all experienced, uh, because it's part of the suite of physiological experiments that we do, is, is that uh, shortly after landing, we try to walk first with our eyes open and afterwards with our eyes closed. And uh, you know, we were all uh, a little wobbly on our feet, but still capable of walking more or less in a straight line as long as our eyes were open because they were our primary source of, of balance after having been six months in space. Uh, but with your eyes closed, uh, because you haven't used the sense of balance in your ears for six months, uh, your brain has to, you know, sort of reinsert that sensor into its uh, into its uh, suite of sensors, and so that takes a while. And so, with your eyes closed, it's almost impossible. I would say it's om it is impossible to walk in a straight line, which we all quickly, quickly discovered. Um, but now, you know, two weeks later, it, it's no longer a problem. We, you know, our brains have learned to 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 sense balance using our our vestibular systems in the ears again. Uh, but it was certainly interesting, the first day or two, to 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 just to, yeah, to to see how much our bodies had changed. I did a nice tap dance for that <laughs> eyes closed <laughs> test. <laughs> So going back to before your mission all began, Abby wants to know what was the hardest part about preparing for your mission? For me, it, it wasn't necessarily related to the specific training or what we were doing. It was um, we were traveling a lot, but we were gone a week, back a week, gone two weeks back, and um, that just in and out the door, especially with family and with younger kids, I think that was the hardest part of, you know, they'd get in a routine back home and then and then all of a sudden I'd be there again and then and then be gone. And so I think that that was probably the most difficult part uh, of it for me and our family. Yeah, we, we tend to focus on the six months that we're actually in space, but you know, the full mission is actually much longer. It it you know it starts 18 months prior to launch and, and then it continues for at least six months afterwards. Um, and so that, yeah, that's, as, as Jasmine was saying, that's, you know, being in that whole flow is, is can be difficult. Not, nothing special? <laughs> <laughs> it, it's, it's always uh, fun, you learn new things. So we have a question from Deja now who wants to know, we've talked a little bit about, we've touched on some things, likes and dislikes, but she wants to know, what was your favorite part about space and your least favorite? Jasmine, do you want to kick us off? Oh boy, okay. My, oh, it's a top, uh, I'm going to give my three favorite things about space because I can't pick. Um, one was my crewmates, um, you know, Satoshi, Andy, Laurel, and I spent a, a, a lot of time together, and then uh, Kosya, Alec, and uh, Kolya. And um, we just, I mean, the, for me, the people make the mission, and we laughed so much up there, and um, I just, just really had a, a great time. So th that was definitely one big thing for me. Uh, floating, I, I had dreamed about flying and floating as a kid a lot, and it totally lived up to expectations. I never got tired of it. I was playing with it uh, till the very end of the mission, and I'm very sad that I can't float here. And then, uh, and then I'd say the final thing was was looking looking out the window. Um, you you just can't beat that view, and it was spectacular every time. And not just looking at Earth, but even looking at the space station itself, uh, and just thinking about wow, we we built this thing here, orbiting uh, the space. Uh, as a team, an international team together, and it's really, it's really a marvel of engineering, and so such a cool thing. And your least favorite? My okay. least favorite, doing stowage <laughs> <laughs> on space station. <laughs> that was actually one of my favorite. It things. was. <laughs> it worked out. Andy loves doing stowage. <laughs> Yeah, I, I like cleaning up the space station <laughs> and feeling like, oh, it's tidy again. <laughs> I'm glad you like it. <laughs> no, other, I mean, otherwise, Jasmine hit it on the head. You know, her, her, her top three would also be my top three uh, favorite things on board the space station. Yeah. And uh, there's, nothing, there's nothing particular that I didn't like. Uh, I mean, you know, as we talked about a little bit earlier, the 
after a few months, you know, I would have liked some different food, but <laughs> apart from that, everything was great. Well, uh, under zero gravity, uh, things can easily be uh, lost, floated away and lost. That might be kind of challenging. I still like it, but challenging. <laughs> Definitely. So uh, we do have this question from social media, and Jasmine brought it up. So since you guys were talking about how much you, you laughed and had a good time on Space Station, Emily on Instagram wants to know who told the best jokes in space. So, I don't know, that's a tough one. I think we were all pretty hilarious. <laughs> but Satoshi would sometimes come out of nowhere with something and just make us all laugh. A, a few things come to mind, but, but one, for example, one time Laurel, Satoshi, and I were trying to get Andy's attention, and um, Andy just wasn't hearing us, and Sato <laughs> Satoshi goes, Andy, Andy, Andy. <laughs> and we did that the rest of the mission. Anytime we wanted to get Andy's attention, we, we would do that. So I don't know. There were a lot of little moments like that, I think. Yeah. <laughs> I, actually, I thought, having talked about the, the tool bag, I thought you were going to bring up that moment. Because we were one time, we were, uh, uh, we were in node one, I think, having lunch or dinner or yeah. something. And, and Satoshi had been out in Cupola taking pictures. And then he comes in, and he's like, oh. You know, I'm very, very, very sorry, but you know, I, I took this this picture, and we were all thinking, what's going on? And he had managed to take a picture of the tool bag as it was uh, transiting Mount Fuji. Mount Fuji. Yeah, yeah. He, Satoshi had been trying to take a picture of Mount Fuji, and then ended up with a picture of the tool bag. It was very, very impressive. And then afterwards, I remember asking Satoshi, "Did you get the photos you wanted <laughs> of Mount Fuji?" And he says. No, then I was focused on the tool bag. <laughs> so sorry. A little photo bomb there. Um, on a more serious note, we do have a question from social media that wants to know what inspired you, all three of you, to become an astronaut? Um, I mean, for, for me, for, for me, what's so special about the job uh, of being an astronaut is Really, it's about exploration uh, in, in the broadest sense possible. It's about not just expanding our horizons physically, uh, but also in, in terms of knowledge. Um, you know, we, we, we travel into space, uh, but we're also conducting science, uh, you know, for the, for the benefit of all of us. It's about pushing the boundaries, expanding our knowledge, and, and becoming smarter about ourselves uh, our world and uh, the universe around us. And that, that, I think, is the most exciting thing you can do. And, and the fact that the job uh, as an astronaut combines both the kind of the, the, the mental exploration that is science with the physical exploration of actually traveling into space yourself, those two aspects make it the, the most fascinating, fascinating job you can have, I think. OK, thank you for that response. Did you have a question? So that is about all of the questions that we have. Um, I want to leave us on a note. Um, so my question to you all is what comes next? Um, I imagine you guys are probably going to head home, see some family. Is there any readaptation left to go through? What, what, where do you go from here? Um, so we were still, um, for about the first month and a half, we're doing reconditioning with our, uh, you know, our ACERs, our trainers. Uh, so we'll continue to do that. Debriefs are very important, um, figuring out what things did we do right, what things can we do better, and, and learning lessons from those for the future missions. Um, and then I think we'll each have a, a bit of downtime to, um, you know, as, as we mentioned, it's not just the six months, but the time leading up to the mission. Uh, we were also gone a lot, so spending some time with our uh, uh, families and things like that. Uh, and then I'll be ready for another space flight. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and for, for me, um, you know, I've, I've been now in Houston uh, working uh, here at the Johnson Space Center on behalf of the European Space Agency for the past uh, eight years. And so it's time for me to go back to the European Astronaut Center in Cologne, Germany, uh, and to uh, share some of my knowledge and experience that I've gained here at NASA for the past eight years, and hopefully uh, share that with my colleagues uh, in Europe and, and let the uh, ESA's manned or uh, human spaceflight program benefit from that. 
Yeah. Well, uh, similar to Andy, uh, sometime this year I'm going back to uh, Japan and, and work in uh, JAXA and share my experience and support the upcoming mission crew members, fellow crew members, Kimia and Takuya, and uh, others as well, and supporting technical demonstration. Sounds like an exciting couple of months ahead for this crew. Uh, crew 7, thank you so much for joining us. We have Jasmine Mogbelli, Andreas Mogensen, and Satoshi Furukawa. Of course, another member of the team is Konstantin Borisov. He could not be here with us today as he's already gone home and reunited with his family. If these astronauts have inspired you to, to become an astronaut yourself, uh, go ahead and apply to become an astronaut because our applications are open and we are looking for you. So go ahead and put your application in. We've got more information on nasa.gov. Crew 7, it sounds like you've got an exciting couple months ahead. So thank you so much for talking to us. That concludes our event. Thank you very much for joining.